Today I'm bringing you a sermon titled, Consider Yourself. And this is a sermon that um, you're going to have to preach and re-preach and preach to yourself again and again. So I thought we would move further and I'm going to pick up and preach an entire sermon on Romans 6.11, which is the last verse of two weeks ago's sermon, because this is pivotal for you as a believer. So my cry today is that you would guys, that I, myself, we would have revelation. We need revelation. We need heart understanding. So why don't you just take your hands out like this, and we're just going to pray. Father, we lift our hands out as an act of just humility, of surrender. And Lord, as a people, as a congregation this morning, we pray the eyes of our heart would be opened. Lord, that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Lord, I pray that every brother and sister of mine would be forever changed by this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Not because I have polished words, but because God wants to move in our lives. Romans chapter 6, we've been talking about it. It's where we've been camped out. Paul is writing to the Roman church, and he's writing to them about continual repeated sin. We looked at the passage, verses 1 through 11 last week, where then Paul lays out some really important doctrinal things that must be understand understood. You remember three times in this passage, Paul says, don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know, he said. And we came face to face with the reality that what we don't know about Scripture really is hurting us. You know, there is that whole adage that's thrown around, you know, what I don't know doesn't hurt me. What I don't know, that is so wrong. And how Satan wants to keep you in ignorance. He wants to keep you confused. He wants to keep you not knowing God's word. Because if he can do that, then he can keep you bound. And he can keep you in chains. And so when Paul writes to the Roman church, you've got to understand he's writing to them because there's this void of knowledge. A void of theological understanding. A void of really grasping what had happened to them. And i got to be honest with you guys. How many of you remember the story where Jesus walks up and heals the blind man? He leaves and the Pharisees are so infuriated. They go and they start interrogating him. And I think I have the scripture in the lineup. If we want to put it up. John 9.25. The second time they interrogate this guy, he says, I don't know whether he was a sinner or not. But I know this one thing. I was blind and now I can see. You remember that text? Now, that's a beautiful text, but I want to pull out a principle from this that really isn't even related to this. I just want to use that as a springboard. There's a lot of people in church that were blind, but now they can see, but they don't know who Jesus is, and they really don't know what happened. And that's what Paul's writing to in the Roman church. A bunch of people that were blind, but now they can see, but they don't know who Jesus is. They don't really know what happened to them. So what I need you to understand is today we're camped out on what happened to me when the chain was cut. Remember the bolt cutters? The hidden transaction that happened in our heart. When that chain that was unseen, the chain that was on the inside, the chain that had me bound, the chain that represents being in the world or unsaved, when, when Christ cut that, when he saved us, we're at a point today of looking at what happened. That we would know it. That we wouldn't just say, I'm saved. But we would know what has positionally happened to us. This is what Paul's teaching to the church at Rome. This is what God is teaching to Abundant Harvest. This is important for us to realize because in the day that we live, we're not just trying to get people saved, we're trying to disciple people. Go and make disciples. And part of discipleship is that we ingrain into people the truth of what happened. So let's just recap. Paul laid forth three important things. We were baptized in Christ, meaning we became one substance with him. That we were one with Christ. Second thing, we identified with Christ's death and his resurrection. So whenever we became born again, there was a death that happened to our sinful man. It was identified with Christ's death. And then there was a resurrection that happened of my inner man. And that's connected to Christ's resurrection. And so Christ died, was raised to newness of life. Tim died. Tim's sinful man died. And I was raised to newness of life. I am a new Creature. Romans 6 5 was our text. Again, since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. So there's that uniting in death, raising to newness of life. Jesus had to die and he had to be raised to life. Guys, not just to fulfill prophecy, but so that 
Art could die and be raised to newness of life. That Art Myers would be a new creature. That Carol Cahill could die here in 20, whatever year you got saved, 8, 19, and, and get saved. That there's a death and, what, I don't know, what, what year was it, Carol? Put her on the spot. 1970s. So that today we can have our sinful man die and our new man be raised to life. So this Jesus dying on the cross thing isn't just about a story or a fulfillment of prophecy. It continues to be lived out daily as we see people in the world dying, their sinful man be died, be, be put to death, crucified with Christ, and being raised again. So this identification in Christ's death and resurrection is very, very important. And so this being raised to new life means everything to us as a church, as a people. And so then the third thing we looked at is our body of sin is destroyed in this process. Romans 6, verses 6 to 7. We know that our sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. And so believers must emphatically believe that they are free from sin. That there has been that chain-cutting moment in their life where deep on the inside the things you can't see that the chain was truly cut and so that transaction that happened we have to believe that we have to know that emphatically we died with christ we were set free from the power of sin and so the the reality is guys this chain has truly been cut it's not connected it's in two pieces and so there is no sin no addiction no stronghold in our life that cannot be overcome after we are saved. That is something we must own. That if I die and I am raised to newness of life, the chains have been cut. And so this is the power of the gospel. It's the salvation for all. And it's the freedom for all. You know, the world will try to get free without a death to self. And it can never happen. Ever happen. There must be that salvation experience. Must be that moment in time where we are born Again, guys, we're not just trying to make our coworker a better person. We're trying to get them born again. We need their sinful man to be crucified with Christ that they might be then reborn, born again to a place to where the chains can then start being cut off and they can live free. So John 8, 36, we know this truth, but I need you to remember it again and again. If the sun sets you free, you are truly free. We need to own this like never before. We must realize that we're free on the inside. What I'm delivering to you today is theory. Paul is in a transition in verse 11, we're about to get to it, where he then begins to talk about the practical outflow of the, the chain being cut here. The death of my sinful man and the resurrection of my new man. And so Paul's in this transition in the text. We're, we're talking about this theory of being baptized in Christ, identified in his death, identified in his resurrection, and the, the sin being destroyed, and that we need this true conversion. And how does this play out? How does it work out in my life? And so we get to Romans 6 verse 11. It comes this pivotal vo uh, verse in the text where then Paul says this, you should also consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. This is Paul's transition statement in this text where he starts now to talk about the life you're living. You might still be living with chains wrapped around you. You might still have bondage in your life, but you should consider yourself to be dead. You should consider yourself as being a free man because the chain was cut. So you must understand, you must know, church, what happened when you were born again. It's not just that well, I don't know. I, I'm just saved. I pray to prayer. You must know that your old nature died and that there was a breaking of the power of sin. You must know this. So Paul says, consider yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God. Now, we're going to take a little rabbit trail because I want you to grasp this. This is what Paul's doing. In John chapter 11, you remember the story of Lazarus. Lazarus is sick, right? And Jesus is doing ministry in another part of the region. Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, come quickly, Lazarus is sick, he might die. Jesus deliberately stays where he's at, that Lazarus might die, so that this 
might point them to God, right? Jesus is teaching. He deliberately stays four days. Four days is important. We're not here to teach on this story. Lazarus dies. They're wailing. They're, they're doing their Jewish you know, mourning process. Lazarus has been wrapped. He's been buried. And so Jesus comes and he says to them in John 11, 25 to 26, one of the great I am statements, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And what you have going on here is believing some things you can't see. Okay, so Jesus is really teaching some things about the theory or the things that are known in the spirit, the things that are of faith, that do you believe this even though you can't see it? Your brother's in the grave, but I am the resurrection and the life. So there's this teaching moment where Jesus is speaking to the things that aren't seen, and that's where we're at today. So then, the Bible tells us, upon saying this to Mary and Martha, that his spirit was deeply moved. He leaves the house or the gathering and he walks over to the tomb. And he's deeply moved. And he commands them to remove the stone. And they start to protest. But Jesus, he's been dead for four days. His body is going to stink. What are you doing? is remove the stone. They roll the stone back, and then Jesus, speaking into the tomb, says, come forth. Right? I'm paraphrasing. Come forth. Now, this is an important story for a couple reasons. Because here's a dead man that Jesus raises to life. Come out. That which... The natural eye can't see, that which logic and science has defined, that which we're convinced that we're convinced of, come out, Lazarus. And out walks a man with grave clothes on. The Bible says in John eleven forty four, let's read it together. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth, and Jesus told him, unwrap him, and let him go. That is a prophetic statement, church. Because here's a man that just got saved. He was born again. He had a new life given to him, okay? I'm using some creative liberty here. But he came out of that born again experience wrapped in grave clothes. Wrapped in flesh. When he was brought to life, he didn't just walk out in a suit and a tie. He didn't walk out all perfect. He came forth and there was life on the inside. Chains and grave clothes and flesh on the outside. Unwrap him and let him go. We're at a point in the text where Paul now begins to talk about the unwrapping of the grave clothes. And that is where we're going to be at as we begin to move on. You must grasp what is happening because you've been born again you still got grave clothes on you. Um, it would have been a great idea to get a roll of tissue paper and wrap me up. Hmm. Maybe we should do that live. You'll never forget it. The taking off of the grave clothes. Unwrap him and let him go. So this story, I want to bring back to Romans now, is an illustration of how someone gets saved and there's new life that comes, but there's still grave clothes on them. And so Paul says, consider yourself alive to God. Consider yourself dead to sin, even though there still might be some sinful capacity in your life and some things in your life that are not pleasing to God. There's new life. Lazarus, you're alive and you're well. Church, you might not be perfect. You might still have grave clothes on. But you've been born again. And you're alive and you're well. Consider yourself alive unto God. Consider yourself made new. And so despite this new life on the inside, new believers can still have the wrapping or the binding of grave clothes in our life. And so they don't just always fall off. 
And so now we must deal with this. And this is where we live. The rubber meets the road. And so this comes forth as the most freeing thing for us as we move forward the next couple weeks, the most empowering thing as you walk with your brothers and sisters. Because notice, Jesus didn't say, Lazarus, take it off. He looked at the crowd and said, take it off. Unwrap the man. And there becomes that community body discipleship aspect of freedom that we've been talking about. So this is a battle to where we're at in Romans. The John 11 is a window into what Paul's addressing in Romans 6. Romans 6, 11, let's put it on the screen again. So you should consider yourself, say consider yourself, to be dead to sin and alive to God. The sermon you're going to have to keep preaching to yourself as the grave clothes continue to bind you and hold you back. Consider yourself alive. You know, it's like Lazarus. Pinch yourself. You feel it? You're alive. Consider yourself alive. That's what Paul's saying. Pinch yourself. Awaken yourself. Take your eyes off what you can see. You're alive despite the grave clothes. And so this language that Paul is saying in this text is like, pay attention! Because if you don't pay attention to what I'm saying right now, if you haven't caught what I just said, you're not going to get what's coming. And so that is what Paul is building through this Romans text. It's powerful. It's something that if you are going to live out the fullness of the new life, you must know what Paul's about to say. You must know you've been baptized in Christ. You've died with Christ. You've been raised and that the old man, the power of sin, has been broken. You must know that you're not who you used to be. You must know that you are not a remodeled sinner. You are a remade saint. That you've been taken, right? Lee said, from unbelief into belief. That there has been a deep transaction or deep transfer that's happened. And so despite the conflict with the sin, you know, the grave clothes. You guys know that struggle? Wouldn't it be great to wrap me up and then have me get out in front of you? The wrestle, the struggle, the, the fighting with the bound, the binding. Despite the conflict with sin, you must know, church, that you are not under the control of sin. And so these are deep things that Paul is beginning to impart to the church and he wants to impart to you. We must live. Grasp this church. Take a note to write this down. You must live with the reality the revelation that when you sin, it is contrary to your nature. You might have some stinky grave clothes hanging on you. You might act out in sin, but it's not who you are if you're in Christ. We must live with this. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. I need you to grasp the image of Lazarus. That's you, church. That's you. You're alive. Pinch yourself. Pinch the person next to you. I don't care. You're alive. But with brave clothes. And that defines your life and your struggle with sin and with the world. But when you sin, that is contrary to your nature. Before Christ... It was your nature. It was the outflow. It's all that you knew. It's all that you had capacity to do. But in Christ Jesus, old things pass away. And behold, all things become new. We died with Christ. We were raised with Christ. We've been baptized with Christ. We're one with Him. The Spirit of God lives within us. And so when I act out, when I trip because of the grave clothes, not me. It's this grave clothes. It's this wrestling. Consider yourself. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 guys, you know this verse. I want you to know as I read this it's like prophesying over you this morning. This is who you are. You are full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That is who you are. You're born again, recreated. Human spirit that has been raised to life with Christ. This is who you are. But you got grave clothes on. So sometimes you're angry. You're impatient. You lack in love. 
It's the grave clothes, not your deep DNA. Now, I continue to teach this. You're going to have revelation into this. You must understand that when you are patient, you are acting like Christ. Your true man is coming forth. When you're self-controlled in accordance to your new nature. Conversely, you behave in any way that is contrary. You must understand that you can say to yourself, Tim, that is uncalled for. That is not who you are. You are a patient man. And you can prophesy of yourself because it is the Spirit of Christ that lives within us and it is the fruit of the Spirit that defines us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. That is who we are. And somebody say, amen. We just got a lot of grave clothes on. A lot. And some of us more than others. We must recognize that our behavior as Christians is oftentimes directly related to how we consider ourselves. Consider yourself, Paul says. Not alive to sin. Don't consider yourself a glutton. Don't consider yourself an addict. Don't consider yourself an angry person. Don't consider... You are not that if you're in Christ Jesus. Stop prophesying that over yourself. Consider yourself as dead to those things. And you will recognize, you will realize that the power of what God has done on the inside will start to come to the outside. And so it becomes a faith statement. It becomes actually a knowing of what Christ has done. The ignorance that we've walked in for years, possibly decades, it needs flushed, guys. We need to know who we are in Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about just a list. I'm talking about you need to know you're not remodeled. You're not halfway there. The nature of Jesus Christ is who you are on the inside. He's imputed that to you. And so it's about faith. It's about understanding what he has done. And so Paul says, consider yourself dead to sin. Consider yourself dead to sin. I want to run through this quickly and give you four reasons why we do not. Okay, so these are negatives. But I felt led to do this because I think the Lord wants to highlight or put a finger on some beliefs or lies that we carry that cause us to think contrary to Scripture. Reasons believers do not consider themselves dead to sin. Number one, we wrongly believe that salvation is not the death of our sinful nature. We believe that the sinful nature, many times, I'm, I'm talking a generalization, and one of the reasons why we don't hold to this correct view is we believe, based on experience and what we see, that our sinful man is fully alive and still fully functioning and still fully powerful in us. And so we oftentimes approach salvation as this transactional, theoretical Thing that has happened in heaven but is not really equated on earth. In other words, God's going to save me. God still sees me as righteous. I'm going to make it into heaven. But in terms of my daily life, sin is still alive and well and it dominates my life. Okay, there's a belief or a lie or maybe I should just say a confession within the body of Christ that does not properly recognize that our sinful nature has died. And so this idea is further taught that our sinful man is still alive and well, and that there's this battle between these two natures, um, the idea that salvation is just this addition into our life, that it's not a deep transformation. How many of you ever heard the good dog, bad dog thing? Whichever dog you feed is the one that's going to win, right? That is totally wrongly applied to salvation. We must recognize that the bad dog is dead. That there is only a good dog deep on the inside. I still have a capacity to sin. Hear me. We're going to talk about this in the upcoming weeks. But from this place of understanding, we must understand salvation is done. It's final. I'm not 75% saved. I'm not 75% transfer, transformed into the likeness of Christ. Christ is in me. The hope of glory. 100%. But the bad dog, good dog idea, when it's applied to this area, can lead us further into bondage. There's truth in the good dog, bad dog analogy. But nothing is further from the truth when we're talking about our identity. There is no good dog, bad dog battle anymore. It's good dog. Jesus Christ has won. 
I have surrendered my life. I'm a new creature. I've been born again. I am transferred out of darkness into light. Done. Period. It's over. There is not a bad dog, good dog when it comes to my salvation. Reason number two, Satan does not want believers to know they're free. I want you to realize Satan does not want you to grasp the revelation that you have power over your sinful man. There is a great effort by Satan and his demons to convince you to believe that the power of your addiction, your bondage, and your sin has not been broken. There is an all-out battle to cause you to believe that. And so you must realize that there are lies in your head that are telling you, I might be saved, but I am not free. And this is in your head, and it's beating you down to a place that you do not consider yourself dead to sin. You do not live in a place of faith. There's an enemy that wants you to be totally deceived about what Christ has really done. So reason number two is Satan does not want you to know that you're free. Reason number three, salvation is not always an emotional experience. We need to pause here for a little bit. We have all heard, guys, about people that came to Christ and felt something or were instantly transformed. We've all heard those stories. But what about the people that don't have a feeling or an instant transformation? What about them? What if that's you? Reasons people don't believe that their sin nature has totally died is because maybe they haven't had an experience that compares to the person next to them. You must realize that this lie about emotional experiences attached to our salvation or born-again experience leaves many of us thinking, bad theology or bad understanding about our born-again experience. The inner workings of your salvation has nothing to do with a physical, observable sign. You need to know this by faith. But somehow, in many circles, we have placed an emphasis or this unspoken thing into the, the mix to where we feel confused or we don't grasp we don't understand because i didn't feel church you need to know you may or may not feel anything but that does not matter what matters is faith praise god for feeling praise god for sensing we love those things god has made us emotional feeling people we can at times sense the presence of the holy spirit but i gotta tell you there's a lot of times i don't but by faith i know he's right here it's not about what we feel. But we bring feelings into this mix or into the equation of freedom from sin and freedom from our sinful nature. You must understand it doesn't matter how you feel, your sinful man has died. He's dead. He's buried. And you're alive in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter how you feel. Believers are commanded to live by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, you know this verse. But we live by believing. We live by faith and not by sight. That is who we are. And so I got to be real with you guys. As your pastor, we could just, as much as I love emotion, we could just get away from emotion for a little bit we in many ways would be a lot better off. What am I saying? We have a church full of people, and I'm not meaning any one of you in particular. I'm just talking at large in the American church. When a Christian feels discouraged, they act discouraged. When a Christian feels like quitting, they quit. When Christians feel like sinning, they sin. And we live in this realm of feeling more than by faith. So when we feel discouraged, we're not to act discouraged. When we feel like quitting, we are not to quit. When we feel like sinning, we are not to sin. When we feel condemned, we're not to believe the condemnation. When we feel an opportunity as God, we're not to just act out without confirmation. We don't live by our feelings. 
We live by faith. And so even if I feel like I'm in bondage, I know that I'm not. Because I don't believe based on what I feel. I believe based on what God says. Why do people not grasp what happened in salvation? Because they believe based on what they feel. Not based on what they know the Word of God says. You can't wake up and decide if you're coming to church based on how you feel. Let me just give it to you on a platter. There it is. You can't just worship based on how you feel. The amount of feelings, church, that control us and are behind our behavior is astronomical. And it's a sign of immaturity. Now granted, I love feelings. And praise God that whenever you step out of the boat, remember the kayak, you step out into the grace of God. I love when I sense His presence. I love the feeling of the Lord. But guys, feeling or no feeling, we will live for the Lord. Feeling or no feeling, I know that Christ fully is alive and well and that I am not a sinner, that I am a saint. And that when I sin, it's not who I am. It's not an outflow of my nature. My old nature, dead. And I'm alive in Christ. Faith. Knowing. Understanding. And so we don't live by God based on how we feel. Number four, the experiential battle with sin seems to contradict the truth. I already touched on this, but listen, we've been made new on the inside since power has truly been broken. But yet we ask this question, why in the world am I so strongly tempted? And why do I give in to sin so frequently? Again, basing our theology more on what I feel on an everyday basis than on the word of God. And so when we live in this place of experience, this is the reason why Paul writes to the church and said, consider yourself. In the moment of feeling, in the moment of of emotion, in the moment you want to look and say, well, that isn't true because of. In the moment you want to say, I'm an addict, I'm a failure, I'll never break through. I consider myself. My experience does not define me. And so we are to consider ourselves as an act of stirring our faith, of building yourself up. Church, you're going to have to preach this message to yourself. You're going to have to tell yourself, I'm born again. I have been made new. All that is gone. The power of sin has been broken. I'm alive and well in Jesus Christ. You're going to have to preach this because you need your spirit man built up. Jude said, build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying. There is this this very real concept in Scripture that Paul is praying is pulling from when he says, consider yourself, consider yourself. Because the more I walk around and say, Tim, you're a saint. Tim, you're a saint. Tim, you're a saint. The more that Lauren says, Tim, you're a saint. Tim, you're a saint. Tim, you're a saint. The more I believe it. Faith comes by what? Come on, baby. Tim, you're a saint. Wrapped in grave clothes. We must consider ourselves that it stirs and speaks to the inner man that we would then have belief in that. Because guys, God calls you to believe things that you can't see. All I see is this. I consider these broken. I consider myself not bound. Why? Because that is the truth. And so considering myself dead to sin and alive to God, considering myself dead to sin, alive to God, dead to sin, alive to God, when I fail, Tim, you're dead to sin. That's not you. This is who you are. So listen, I'm not an alcoholic. I've been set free from alcoholism. I'm not a porn addict. I've been set free from lust. I'm not controlled by anger. I've been set free from anger. I am not a glutton. I've been set free from gluttony. I am not you fill in the blank. I have died with Christ and Christ has been raised to newness of life. I am a saint. I am made in the image of Christ. 
My truth, this truth is not based on what I think or how I feel, but by faith. I consider that and I believe that. This is good news. Gospel preaching. What are we doing as ministers of the gospel? What are we speaking to our coworkers? It isn't some weak, empty, hollow message. It's a message that says, come to Jesus Christ, that you might die, and there might be a new life raised up within you, a life you can't even grasp, you can't even comprehend, you can't even imagine, a life that is new. This is gospel preaching. This is gospel sharing. This is the good news. And this is the news that every believer must know. That God has broken the power of sin. Raised them to life. So that they can not just live victoriously. But live with a knowing of who I am. So Lauren, why don't you come to the piano. I have a few more minutes with you guys I want to share. But um, what I want to say in this moment kind of sets the stage for next week. You must grasp this. Why did I take a whole week on this? Because this is foundational to who you are. Absolutely foundational. This has been something that the Lord revealed to me years ago, and it's the only reason I stand before you today, because I was able to consider myself something that I was not seeing, something that I was not grasping in the natural. I could consider myself. You want to get from point A to point B, church? You need to consider yourself. You need to preach this sermon. You need to remind yourself. You need to renew your faith. Now, hear me. These truths that I just shared with you, this theory, this hidden, does not deny the fact that you're going to get angry, you're going to get drunk, you're going to look at porn, you're going to eat too much again and again, whatever. Whatever. We still have a capacity to sin. We still got grave clothes on. Why don't you come on up? We got a volunteer in the back that's wrapped in grave clothes. He was voluntold. Someone has received well from me. Voluntold is a new word around here. Listen. We have grave clothes and things that remain on us, so we still do get angry, guys. We still do get drunk or do things we shouldn't do. But the truth that sin has died in my life does not mean that you don't have the capacity to sin. It simply means that this is not who you are any longer. Paul's going to get into this like full-blown. Romans 7, if you know what Romans 7 is, you really wrestle through some of this stuff. It's an incredible outflow and a wrestling and a battling of this life on the inside that's wrapped in grave clothes. And I do what I don't want to do. And this wrestling and this slavery and the bondage and your slave to righteousness, not slave to sin. I mean, these are things Paul's going to really talk through and we're going to work through them together. Paul's going to continue to address this. But you must take away from today, church. You must consider yourself completely new in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17, you've got to read it again. You've got to see it again. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. You're looking at it right here. This is salvation. Still, in many ways, with grave clothes wrapped up. The old has gone on the inside. The new has come. There's still grave clothes. You with me? I want you to see this illustration. It, It We don't preach a gospel that says come to Jesus and you're perfect. That's not the gospel. The power of sin has been broken and you're made new. And through the power of God, the grave clothes continue to come off more and more. As we are sanctified, we continue to live unto the Lord. Paul uses the analogy of take off and put on repeatedly through his epistles. Take off the grave clothes, church. But on the inside, new. You've been made new. Romans 6, 11. We'll get it again. We'll get it again. Look at, look at Bean. Look at Bean first. That's salvation. Covered in grave clothes. Now look at the scripture. Read it out loud, church. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ 
Jesus. You cannot believe the lie that you're anything other than a new creature in Christ. You're redeemed. You're holy. You're a child of God. The Lord has done a miracle deep on the inside. And His Word calls us to believe. To believe. Let me read you three scriptures. Galatians 2.20 My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God. Trusting Him who loved me and gave Himself for me. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8 For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. Colossians 2 and verse 13 You were dead because of your sins and because of your sin and, and because your sinful nature. Sorry, I have a typo on my notes. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for He forgave all your sins. Why don't you stand with me, church? I want to read these final statements. Church, when you sin, how do you respond? When you leave today and you sin, how do you respond? You consider yourself. Okay? We're not going to confess. I'm an idiot. I'm going to consider myself alive to God. You're not going to say to yourself, I'll never change. I will never get free. You are such a failure. When you sin, that's all negative. That is all death. That is a prophecy from hell. When we fall, when we stumble because of the grave clothes, you remind yourself that you are dead to that sin. You are alive to God. And so you say, I am not an idiot. It is not who I am. I am not a glutton. When you feel sick in your stomach and you're puking because you ate too much. I am not a glutton. It is not who I am need to learn from where I gave into temptation and you need to choose you need to choose to behave opposite of your sinful nature this is a positive response let me take 30 seconds and tell you something that's a very important outflow of this Come on. so this is a picture of us whenever we get saved and transformed but we oftentimes let the grave clothes define us and when we stumble we're condemned we feel like an idiot you guys know the feeling right you know the condemnation what does Romans 8 1 say there's no condemnation there's no condemnation why because inside I've been made new I'm whole I'm pure I want you to know that Satan has you guys so beat down because when you stumble you blame the inside and not the grave clothes Stop blaming the inside and start learning and taking off the grave clothes and prophesying life. When you parent, so this is a parenting tidbit, but I need you to understand this is how God parents us. This is what God does. When our kids mess up, we have been taught, this is not original, we have been taught something that's called the positive conclusion. Because how many of you know God ends all discipline positive? as he breathes life into his sons and his daughters. When you sin and it ends bad, you're under the influence of the wrong voice. Heavenly Father ends it positive every time. When our children mess up, when they fall, they sin, they break a rule, you fill in the blank, there's lots of them. The children are asked three questions. What did you do that was wrong? Confess your sins. He's faithful and just. Forgive your sin. Every one of us need to confess what we did wrong. The second question the child is asked in our family, Lily, Ruby, Ben, and Nathan. Why is it wrong? You need to understand what's going on with these grave clothes. You understand why was your behavior wrong? What law did it violate? What rule did it break? And then we ask the child a third question. What are you going to do different next time? As they begin to posture their heart towards the next time they're in that situation, the next moment where they're faced with this temptation, 
or this grave clothes that, that is a challenge to them. My children know what their grave clothes are. I talk to them about their grave clothes. What are you going to do different next time? And here it is, the positive conclusion. Go and do better next time. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Go and live out your nature. A positive takeoff into the future to live out of the new man and not the old man. Church, consider yourself. Consider yourself alive to God, an overcomer, one that will be victorious and live, one that will consider yourself and end all of this condemnation and negativity and the death that's prophesied, end it with a positive, with God speaking life, because God says you're alive in Christ Jesus. You have been made new. This is who you are. So Bean, consider yourself a free man. Consider yourself as one that can see out of both eyes. (laughs) Consider yourself as one that can speak. Consider yourself as one that can run. Consider yourself consider yourself and the more Lauren prophesies that I'm a saint the more I begin to believe that I'm a saint and the more that this stuff starts to come off because I start to believe who I am and I start to live that way and the more and the more that daddy says over Nathan go and do better son that's not who you are that's not who you are the more the grave clothes start to come off and they fall off and now my children start to function as children of God. The more that the people of God begin to function like the people of God. Because they're hearing the positive. They're considering themselves. They're recognizing that I am not defined by my behavior. I'm defined by the inner working, the miracle of what God has done within me. I might stumble. I might trip. Not who I am. Not who I am. Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you, God, for the incredible message, the timeless message of the gospel. Lord, may we at Abundant Harvest not be those that don't know. May we be the ones that know what Christ has done. And may we live every day considering ourselves to be alive to God. Lord, may we have eyes to see, hearts to believe, the unseen, May we live from this place, God. Lives that are victorious, ever increasingly victorious. I prophesy that over this church. Ever increasing victory. Ever increasing freedom. May the grave clothes begin to come off as we realize this is not who I am. This is not who I am. Father, thank you for the revelation this morning. Thank you, God, for transforming and forever changing lives. Lord, we love the message of the cross. It's foolishness to the world. But to us that are being saved, it's the power of God. We love it. We thank you that it is alive and well within us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Have a great week living for the Lord Jesus.